Wow. Marhaba, Austin. Really excited to be here today. Hope everyone's um, juiced up and ready to go. Here with the legend, Hamdi Ulukaya. Very excited to have you here, Hamdi. Good to be with you. Um, so really quickly, I want to kind of get started with a pretty pertinent topic that's kind of just happened here, right, before we get into all the other content. But a gentle reminder, right, February 6th was a pretty big day. Um, 7.8 magnitude earthquake hitting Turkey and Syria, killing thousands of people. Um, it was one of the deadliest natural disasters in the century. And you were one of the first people to really respond, donating a million dollars of your own money um, to the Turkish philanthropy funds and matching over a million dollars in donations. And then to date, yes. <laughs> get ready, you're going to do it again. You also able to get the business community mobilized to raise $14 million already? Yeah, so that's crazy. Um, can you talk? Yes. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit why this has been so important to you? Sure. Um, so hopefully we'll get, you know, as we go further, why I am so honored to be with you. Um, and, and this has been a long time coming for me to be able to be with Asha here. Um, and we go, we go back. On the topic of earthquake, um, you know, Turkey is known, earth shakes in Turkey. Um, with, you know, people learn to live with this. And you always have back of your mind, one day, this earth is going to get angry. And, and you always worry about this. I'm from the province of Erzincan, which is northeast of Turkey. And in 1939, you know, our grandmothers and grandfathers and everybody would talk about how a whole city was wiped out. Like, totally. There was one train station the south of train station, I think, is completely gone. And then they built a new city on the north side of things. Um, it can be extremely powerful. And then you come 1999, it's a living memory uh, in a town close to Istanbul, earthquake happened. And I think over 30,000 people died. So when, when, when people die, or when this happens, it's not just happened to people who live in this town. Yeah, it affects everybody. And if you live through it, that movement, some say, you can never get over from it. Yeah. Um, and the economy dies, a lot of things inside of the people die, enormous amount of effect on, on education, to health system, to job market, to everything get affected. And it takes years and years and years to be built back. So for me, it's a, it's a very known you know, uh, emotion and, and effect. So I hear this. I think it's the middle of the night, I wake up to drink you know, a bottle of water and, and went on my phone and realized this happened. Um, so, immediately back to DC, I'm so proud, the White House, uh, the USAID, the State Department, the American friendship to Turkey has been deep, it's been long, and, and that response really made me, made me you know, hopeful. Um, immediately try to see what we can do. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is it's winter, it's extremely cold. This is, you're talking about 10 to 12 million people affected among five cities. And then it's, you know, 7.8. You're looking at the collapsed buildings. You just make a math in your mind what that toll can, you know, can be. So immediately you come to, okay, people are going to leave from this town, this, from their homes in the middle of the night, like 4.07 a.m., when it's middle of cold winter, uh, children, elders, everyone. So you're going to need food, you're going to need shelter, you're going to need water, um, safety, whatever, blankets. And that is the immediate response. And then um, rescue efforts. So clock is ticking, and you're going to hear voices under the buildings, the difference this time, which I will always be affected by this, I'm on my Twitter, people are tweeting under the buildings. I said, I am under the building with my mom, with my son. It is, um, it is unbelievable event. I mean, before it was on TV, right? In 1999, it was on TV. Today, it's on Twitter, and people are trying to save their phone so the battery doesn't die, and they're giving coordination of which building they are, and they're waiting. Um, 
unfortunately, a lot of people um, died waiting. Yeah. Um, so that's, we will always remember that. So the rescue effort is 48 hours, top, top, 72 hours, but really most happened in 24 hours. I think the history is gonna judge how country responded, but I can tell you this, I've never seen international community and business community come together and try to reach out. And this is the time the first responders were Americans, Armenians, Greeks, Israelis, you, know, you name it. Um, people immediately responded, sent their people. Um, and, and I think most of the work, now the rescue thing is gone, is the rebuilding. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a longer effort. My, my, my biggest interest is how do, we, how do we stay on when cameras are off? Yeah. You know, when news cycles go to next things, how do we stay on um, and help women and children and economy? These are beautiful communities. Um, Hatay is in the south side of the Syria, Syrian border, a, a city. Some say it's one of the oldest cities. Um, and you're talking about, you know, Maraj, Karman Maraj, you know, you're talking about Adiyaman. These are southeastern part of Turkey, which is the richest from the culture, the food, the diversity, the historical, uh, uh, you know, color and, 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 and history. Um, so I hope, I hope it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't lose the fabric. Uh, you, you know, this is Mesopotamia. This is thousands of thousands of years. And you know the effects, something like this happens, it has a dramatic effect on, because of survival and, and, and people and community can change. Uh, so it's every single one of our responsibility. I'm so, I'm so grateful, citizens and business people coming together, and people are sending blankets and clothes. And yeah, this is, these are the moments you know you're not alone. I mean, I've said it before, in Turkish we say, dost, um, I don't know if there is any Turkish. Can everybody uh, repeat that? <laughs> Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that means it's a living word. And you say, your friends, I don't know if I am translating right, but your friends make themselves known in bad days. In and I think times, yeah. uh, Turks realized that we had a lot of friends. Well, I don't know if, about everybody here, but you know, most CEOs that I imagine don't keep themselves awake at night to respond to earthquakes and needs for humanity. So I think that says a lot about you as a CEO and a person, Hamdi. And I know there's probably a lot of fans in here of every, all the efforts that you've done over the years. Um, and I know I personally am a fan of the TED Talk you gave in 2019, um, the anti-CEO playbook. Um, but I'd love to share, I'd love you to share a little bit more about the origin story for anyone that hasn't had the chance to hear it from your mouth. Um, you know, you grew up in Turkey, you come to America in 1994, we shared some stories, I'm half Korean, his first Korean experience was dried anchovies, I'm very sorry for him. Um, but you know, being the CEO of a large business, you know, you didn't always think you were going to be a CEO, right? No, no, no. I, I think it's good that we talk about this. And I never thought one day I would be in front of audience in this cool place and talk about this. Um, so I'm from the eastern part of Turkey, as you said. I'm in the northeast. I'm a Kurd. I'm, I, I grew up in a tribal environment. Um, I don't even know my birthday, right? I proudly my dad didn't say, either. I, I, because my, my, my family says we were coming back from the mountains. So basically, I've, I've seen some similar living, believe it or not, in Colorado, uh, you have to take sheep, go up in the mountains when you milk them and, and, and raise them, and then you come back in the winter time to town, you know, go through the winter, and then in the summertime you go up. Um, I grew up in an environment where you couldn't do much with money, yeah. right? So you, if you're up, up in the mountains, even if you have money in your pocket, what are you going to do with this? So money was not part of our living unless you come back to town and you can go to the store and you can buy some nuts and candies and whatever. Um, it, was, um, it was clear to me when I came to, when I went to boarding school and later on university that there is this income inequality, there is this justice that is not served well yeah. between the rural communities and people in, in privilege. And I blamed, in my young time, I blamed the business community for this. I blamed the rich for this. And I grew up hating, literally hating. And I was in that mindset of we need to bring more social justice 
and it has to come through the working class and the, and the, uh, the farmers and, and whatever. And that mindset got me in trouble. So I start publishing in a newspaper in Ankara University and trying to bring some kind of awareness. <laughs> and when I was taken in by a police and there was this famous place in, in the center of Ankara and in the university we knew if you were taken to that place, goodbye. Yeah. You know, who knows what's going to happen to you. This is 1994. I didn't know you were such a bad boy, Hamdi. I wasn't. I, I really didn't get involved. <laughs> I didn't get involved in, t I never believed in arms, you know, uh, or, or fighting with, like I thought it was important um, in a peaceful way, even though conditions were not allowing to. So I did not get involved in that side of things, but I was sympathetic to it. I would be very honest about it. Um, and there were such conditions were so harsh at the time that you could say that I have no option but fight with guns, yeah. right? You could argue that way, which, which I never went that far. So that led me to leave the country because a lot of my colleagues left to Europe and by luck, somebody said, go to America. And, and I had no understanding of American, nothing. And I arrived. October 1994 to Adolfa University. Uh, this year I'm going to give a speech on Adolfa University oh, for graduation, cool. so I'm getting my PhD. <laughs> uh, and there, my first, my first roommate was a Korean guy, um, and he was, that's where we know the, yeah, the, the dry fish. story here. Yeah. So I never thought one day I would be in commerce. I never thought one day I would be buying and selling or something. So I washed dishes, I worked in a farm, in upstate New York for a year and a half, milking 60 cows and doing all kinds of stuff, going to school. And that led me into you know, making cheese because my family was making cheese up in the mountains, so I got into making cheese. And then one day I saw an ad, and it was just like a junk mail came to my, 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 my desk in a 5 p.m. And I'm looking at it, and it says, fully equipped yogurt plant for sale. I literally going through my junk mails and doing this and throwing them, doing this and throwing them. About 20 minutes, 30 minutes later, I went back and picked it up. And now it's covered with my, you know, tea remainings and cigarette remainings that I was smoking heavily. The dried the anchovies. Time. Yeah, all the dried anchovies. <laughs> and I called the numbers. Turns out it's a plant was being closed by Kraft. Yeah. And in the flyer, there are some pictures. You know, there's some picture of the plant, it says 1920, and there are some equipments, and I'm familiar with these dairy equipments, and I'm looking at the calculation, I called the guy and said, he said, it's $700,000. So I'm looking at the building, I'm looking at all these equipment, I said, how is that, they, you know, must be one zero missing in here. Yeah. From Johnstown, New York, which I was having my small cheese factory, to South Edmiston, it's about an hour and 15 minutes drive, if you know how to get there. It took me four hours to find it. And I get there, I walk inside the building, and there are about, I would say, 30 to 50 people working on the side, packing some products. It's, I know this feeling, and I'm not, I, 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 when I, as I talk about it, I am right there. I know this feeling, because in our small town, next to Euphrates River, if somebody drowned into the Euphrates River, or if somebody died, there's something in the air. There's this sadness, there's this, this air of death. It's in the air. And I felt it in that building, in that little town. And it was very familiar to me, you know, growing up. And there was this guy, Rich, who was the production manager, who showed me all, everything around, and you can tell this thing is so old. You smell yeast, yeah. you smell mold, you smell milk remainings, you smell all kinds of stuff. Nothing dirty, but it's just like, you know, you old. know, that, yeah, old. And the walls are, you know, um, you can tell one day they were white a um, yeah. long, long time ago. So the guy confirmed that this was $700,000. And I called my lawyer at that time, and I talked about this, I said this on TED Talk too. The guy said, okay, let me understand. Here's a, one of the largest food company in the world closing this factory and getting out of yogurt business, which they were, they were making Breyer's yogurt. And he says, who the hell are you? 
Like, who do you think you are? <laughs> so I said, Mario, it's cheap. It's seven hundred thousand dollars. You know, there's no good yogurt in this market. I can make it. He says, no, okay, you don't have $700,000 first, <laughs> and you haven't even paid me for the last six months. You know? Founder's dilemma. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not a surprise to you and everybody else in this place. I will never forget two bankers, John Ryder and Pat Mucci, and local key bank representatives. And they said, Hamdi, if you make a business plan, which I knew nothing about how to write a business plan, if you write a business plan, we'll help you how to write it. We can, we can apply to small business administration loan. If the SBA gives you loan guarantee, the rest will figure it out. So it's like 50% loan guarantee. Yeah. And August 15, 2005, I have this building because of Pat and, and John Ryder. Wow. And then I hired four people from that 55 people because of the manager told me, you know, there is no blueprints of this factory. You will never find anywhere where the lines are, where the electricity lines are, where the pipes are, but except these four people can help you figure out where things are. Did they trust you? <laughs> they, 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 the 55 is making their decisions, life decisions, where to go. This is the last building in that town yep. that had a steam on, now it's cut off, right? So everybody's moving away. This is 2005, six, you know, unemployment is extremely high. And here it is, a Turkish guy, doesn't even know how to speak English. He's not driving a nice car. He doesn't seem like I have a lot of money. And these four people have to make a decision, should they move or should they stay, mm -hmm. right? And the first day I had the board meeting, in that board meeting with those four people, <laughs> <laughs> And they said, they're looking at me, right? Mike, Rich, uh, Maria, uh, and Frank, and me. I love that you still remember their names. Oh, they're still at the plant. They're still at the plant. Yeah. <laughs> Mike retired. Um, okay. And said, okay, so what are we gonna do now? I said, we're gonna go to hardware store, we're gonna buy some paint, and we're going to paint the wall outside. Wow. So the Mike is a you know, quiet guy, he drives Harley, he says, Hamdi, we retired from this plant. I retired from this plant. I don't know when was the last time we painted the walls outside. Tell me you have more ideas than that. <laughs> so he's trying, he's trying to find some kind of sense from me that what I was going to do for them to make a decision. Did they trust me? I think they had a lot of question marks. They said, you know, let's give him a three months. Let's give him three more months. Let's give him three more months. Um, I think that was limited trust. Um, but the three months that we painted those walls, if somebody had told me that two years after painting those walls, we were going to make yogurt from there, and five years after that, we would be a billion in sales. Those four people were going to be 1,000 people. You know, all kinds of stuff was gonna happen. Um, of course, we would have never believed in those things, but I would go back to the moment that I I met with those four people and said, let's paint those walls. Yeah. It was coming out of, I had no other idea other than that. That <laughs> lived, <laughs> that lived within this Chobani journey, you know, all these years. Well, it's a beautiful story. Um, who would have known painting together could be so amazing, but that's why we're here at South By. The culture, collisions, art, business, it's all happening here, and this is a beautiful example of that. So let, let's fast forward. So billion dollars revenue in 2012 from starting by painting a wall in 2005. So you made yogurt something that wasn't even an American thing. Maybe in my household, my dad used to drink it, like gallons of it, and I'd be disturbed watching him do it. But, you know, you've, you've gone from yogurt to now oat milk, coffee, um, you know, so much has changed. Creamers, for yeah, yeah. 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 And, and, and now, you, and I, I think you said, you know, you once said a cup of yogurt won't change the world, but how we make it might. Can you expand on what that means now today? How has that evolved for you today? Sure. My starting point, this whole thing, look, I'm in a tiny little town in upstate New York. I'm from the eastern part of Turkey. I have not seen Austin. I have not seen anyone who has done, who has done this before. I have no visibility to anyone 
who has studied business before, yeah. right? I'm an immigrant who ended up in upstate New York working in a farm, connection with the farmers and workers and the people in the local community. I have not gone to any business schools. Um, I have no knowledge of how anything can start and can be, you know, uh, can be escalated and grown. So I'm coming complete from dark, like literally from complete dark. So if I sit here and say, hey, I have enormous amount of ideas how to build Chobani, I would be lying. I had no idea. Yeah. The starting point I have is why yogurt in this country is so shitty. <laughs> <laughs> like from a consumer perspective, 2005. Correct. I mean, simple this, problem. Yeah, simple thing. You know, where I grew up, yogurt didn't determine where you lived, yep. what kind of income you had. Um, it was just the simplest thing you could have an access to. So you would go to New York City, you would go to fancy stores, you would find some kind of imported yogurts from Greece, some other places that tasted like yogurt. And if you go to a store in Johnstown, you will have a sugar bomb. And it's not yogurt, it's something else. Yeah. So basically you say, why is that? What is, what, is, what, is, what is the reason not having that accessible to everybody? What's the point of that? So I can see there must be a reason. And you, you dig around it and you say, well, Americans will never eat yogurt unless it's very, very sweet, right? The yogurt that you make in Turkey or you make it in Greece or Israel or whatever in that region, people won't eat it here. But then you talk to people and say, oh, I was in Turkey or I was in Greece or I was in Lebanon or whatever it is. The first thing they say, oh, that yogurt with honey or that yogurt with walnuts. You know, they, they yeah. immediately talk about it. So, so the, the thing doesn't match. The second thing is, I remember being very angry. And the anger came from, here it is, a big company, which I hated growing up, again abandoned the community. Yeah. Again. Like, you don't see it only here, you see it everywhere. They just left. They left the factory, they left the people, and you ask the people to the, to the people who are in the community, says, wow, my grandfather worked here, my uncle worked here. I mean, can you at least say goodbye? Can you at least do something about this, right? This irresponsibility. I, I remember my, my youth at that time, it says, how can we make yogurt and how can we completely reverse, like go completely against how the first one who left, you know, against that, per, that, that idea. So I never left that factory from 2005 to 2012. From 2007 to 2012, I have complete blackout. I don't have any idea what happened in the world. Like zero idea. Might be the mold in the factory. I don't know. I mean, it's like <laughs> if, if people made it to Mars, I wouldn't know. Uh, <laughs> I, I was in the factory. I was working. I was making yogurt, eating pizza and bagels for morning and evening. Um, we have no money. We have no experience. Yeah. We have no... Um, resources when it comes to how to sell in, in the world. And we talk about the CPG world. I think everyone who's conscious should know about the CPG world. And yes. you and I, we should talk about it you know, a little bit. And selling to large supermarkets in this country is not for startups. No, it's not. And when <laughs> I'll vouch for that. <laughs> when you go to 2005, it is, it is impossible even, to even to enter at the time. So we don't know how that works. All I have is two years I worked to make this perfect cup of yogurt. And I think what happened is that un not knowing became extreme advantage. Mm -hmm. So we, be we dare to try, really, we dare to try. I would say back to this um, this this place is all I had was how do I grow this business and not to become someone who I grow up hating. Yeah. That was the only thing I had. Nothing else I didn't know. But this, I didn't know I could, be a, I could have an idea on brands. I didn't know I could have an idea on, I don't know, leading four people or 20 people or 100 people later or 1,000 people. I didn't know I could I could create an organization. I didn't know later on I could figure out 
to make a sense of out of this journey. It has been a lonely, alone, with my colleagues and team members up in that little town. The only access I had was the farmers, factory workers, and people in that community yeah. until 2012. So I wish I had an access. I wish. I wish I, I knew some people. I wish it was lonely, it was hard. But at the same time, I realized that there is this, there is this line between sound and noise. Right? There's a lot of people give advice, including me. There's a lot of people make noises. But then there is sounds. And if you are in a quiet place, you hear the sound. You hear the valuable information. And you hear, most importantly, what comes out of you. Even though you don't know anyone, even though you have no experience on this, it's amazing how much you're capable comes out when you start listening to yourself. And I make sense of it after 2012. And when we wake up in 2012, people said, Handy, no one has ever started a company with a few hundred thousand dollars in an old factory on a world of CPG, went from zero with four lanes to a billion in sales without raising a penny of capital. We did not raise a penny of capital until 2012. And we did it with internally. And we went after the world giants, like Dan and, and, and your plate and we captured an enormous amount of um, market share. He says, how did you do it? I said, we were elevated. The common sense didn't matter anymore. Mm -hmm. And we were elevated because we were, we were angry, and, 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 it's, and, and we also loved what we did. It is this mixing of love and anger. And what happened in that community, those factory workers and the farmers and everyone, it became the, this, this magical place that other than gods or earthquakes or whatever that could happen naturally, nothing was gonna stop us. Yeah. We would give everything we have into this idea, prove the first people who left wrong that they made the most mistake. Yeah. That there is still value to these people, there is still value to this factory, there is still value to this idea, that we were going to build something better than before, stronger than before, with less you know, resource than they had, but richer than before. You know what I mean? I think that drive does not come from money. Yeah. You can never elevate yourself that high, unless you smoke some things. And that's, <laughs> that's a different story. That drive can never come from the materialistic thing. So do you think maybe you channeled part of that founder drive, entrepreneurial drive, mission for change into what became the Chobani Incubator? Is that so, why? So that came, and I, I want to come. Later on in 2012, I ha hit a quality problem and almost bankrupt the whole company. And then I had this private equity journey and then get out of this. All that, anything can happen has happened to me. And I thought, what would be things that I would have loved to know yeah. before I started this journey? And that quality thing was one of them. Mm -hmm. And who do you get as a partner was one of them. So I said, what, could I, what would be my gift to the other founders? And say, OK, the things that I would have loved to know before my journey that I know now, that I would love to share with the others. So that's how, Asha, that Chobani Incubator started, is to share my learnings and my journey and Chobani's collective resources with people who has the same mindset, same sources, same resources, same, same ideas. Uh, but like it's funny you're saying Mason that it's Dixie. you wanted to share it, but in fact, what ended up happening as a former alum of the program was Hamdi only spent an hour with us. It was 150 teammates at headquarters and 1,000 teammates in upstate New York that shared their vision, their story, their source of belonging in the company, right? And I think for, for us, it was hearing, I'll never forget, you had a head of customer experience, I think. She was in tears, tears. We, we thought we were just getting a tour of like the CX facility, the phone center. 
and she was in tears talking about remembering you sleeping on a milky floor because the plant quality issues that happened and you did not want to leave the team that had to be there 24-7, yeah. right? And so for us in the incubator, we were all in tears because we were like watching this poor woman like, you know, shook. But it just showed beyond what we're doing, beyond making yogurt, beyond making a product, you're creating an identity for people. You're creating a place that people feel as though they're writing your story for. And in essence, they were training us on what we need to be building, yeah. right? And that is because if we are facing one biggest problem in this country is food problem. So food is controlled in this country by a handful of companies. Yes. The big food, right? The big food affects how food is made in the land, right? So it affects on the farmers and supply chain and the consumers, right? It's so difficult to tra uh, crack it. It's extremely difficult. I mean, I don't think anybody knows. I don't think a lot of people know about this. Like, we know it because we are in it. If there is one industry to crack, the hardest is the food industry in this country. The system doesn't allow startups to get scaled up, to disrupt the category, so the food, how the food is made in this country and how people can have a better access, better access to better food, it, 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 is, it is, is very difficult to change. So it took me 15 years to crack on the yogurt side, right? It, 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 it is extremely difficult. And we can talk about it a little bit more why that is if, when we have time. But then if the journey starts right, I think I found it by accident, but if the journey starts right, that you do not, you do not grow by cutting the promise yeah. because of the financial you know, needs, like whether VCs and whatever the finance that com money is coming from, 99.9% .9 of the startups, cool startups on the food place, that the entrepreneurs are in the right place, they make good food, and they scale the business through the natural channels, and it's about to go up, and that takes four, five, six, seven years. That's when the patient of the finance ends. And that's when it ends up being sold. You know who buys those things? The big food. And you know what they do with it? Kill it. Or keep it quiet. Or they don't know what to do with it. So you end up having the same shit. Yeah. And, and this never changes. So what I said, if we can create a community, right? Mason Dixie, Chobani, and this, and this, and that. And if we can support each other, because no one can do this alone, right? Maybe there's a chance that, that food system, maybe in Austin you can have an access to good food. But if you're living in Norwich, New York, or Twin Falls, Idaho, right? If you're shopping in an ordinary supermarkets, and you have an ordinary income, and you need to feed your children and your family members, that the ingredients is not that long, food is made gently and nicely, and still accessible, right? That's what you're trying to do. So that was the idea of, of, of this, and say, hey, as you grow, be mindful of you know, conditioned finance that are coming in. Yeah. But of course, it has to start from the right founders, it has to start with the right food, right? And then, how do you, how do you, because almost every single founder do want to disrupt, that I know do want to disrupt and serve with the mission making better food for, for the general public, you know, right people. So, But you, you did more than that, though. You really handpicked companies that had mission at their core. That 100%. was in the that's criteria, the, that's right? The, that's, the, that's, the, that's the main criteria, and that comes with the founders, that they have fundamentally have a mission behind this idea. It's not driven by money or wealth, but it's really driven by, I want to make some changes. So that comes back, you know, Enormous, like her, uh, what I find in Asha is her complex thoughtfulness and idea, collection of ideas and the knowledge, and knowledge not only on the food that she's making, but also knowledge on industry, on CPG world, way deeper, richer than what I have started. So you're finding, you're finding founders that they are way sophisticated than I was when I started. 
But yet, still I thought there was some valuable information that I could share with you. So that comes back to you, and if you could share with us and, and, and our guests here is what your thoughts on the CPG industry and what you are trying to do with your uh, initiatives to bring more diversity into, into the world of CPG. Because I think people do not, world, the world does not talk about this big food problem in this country, really. No, they don't. Well, I love how Hamdi turns the chair around to me. This is supposed to be a chat about him, but I, I'll, uh, I'll chat a little bit about Mason Dixie. So obviously, we're a company trying to disrupt the frozen food space, right? It's an inherently dirty space. Um, I grew up in Section 8 housing myself. My dad was a Palestinian refugee, actually, and my mom was a Korean immigrant. But I learned the value of clean eating. Grew up in Baltimore, um, you know, grew up at very modest beginnings, but always had farm fresh home-cooked meal with quality ingredients. I thought it was a sacrilege, fast forward to you know, years ago, right? That um, you know, Popeyes, KFC, homophobic Chick-fil-A. These are, these are the images of American comfort food, right? And here I am, I don't look like the poster child of Southern American comfort food, but I am blue-blooded American as they come. And I couldn't have a platform to talk about it because everyone would judge me based on how I looked or, you know, well, fried chicken's bad for you. Yeah, sure it is when it's pumped with hormones, right? It's two ingredients. It's oil and chicken, right? Like, so, you know, I think in being part of the incubator, right, pulling it back, there were premises of things I wanted to change. I wanted to bring access to incremental change in the comfort food category to make it more natural, to make it more affordable and approachable. Because at the end of the day, we're still going to eat it. Don't act like all oh, y'all ain't gonna have fried chicken later. You will, right? Even if you have a salad five days a week, right? So shouldn't we access better versions of that? And in hearing Hamdi's story over the course of the years, I just, I loved seeing someone that manifested people first, quality nutrition and food, and then company mission behind that. And so being a part of the incubator was incredible because of this exposure to the inner workings of how all of that comes into one big ball. How does that synergy happen to create such a successful company that could grow to a billion dollars in seven years? And I think the biggest thing that I remember beyond talking about mission the way that you and the, t the team, team members at Chobani did was accessing the back office, watching 125 headquarter folks and 1,200 or some odd folks at the factory mold what was just good yogurt into good people, good mission. It's a savior story that was invented by just the teammates. Um, so I want to bring it back again. Are you going to bring the incubator back? Perfect. <laughs> so we, we stopped a pandemic, and we are bringing back. <laughs> so the uh, Choban incubator, food incubator is back, simply because we cannot pause on this, on this mission. It's, it's here in this conference. My call is if there is one urgency, is greater population to access good food is probably one of the most important, most, most critical things. And we have an enormous amount of you know, founders community out there. People are really, really thinking about this. So we're going to bring it back. At Chobani's incubation selection process, we never looked at it from that perspective, but ends up being over 60% of, of the uh, companies that joined the, joined the incubation was female. They were female. Yep. Um, we had 4% or 5% LGBTQ community end up being. It's just best ideas came from, from the diverse community. So one of the best things is happening in the world of food, the female entrepreneurs, diverse entrepreneurs, are coming into the field, which is extremely important. Because you you found out, this world is all white. It is. Right? And what you're trying to do is, and the world of CPG, you know, you, you, all these big food companies, if we have more diversity into leadership, they would not make food, well, I should say, if they could make food that they will serve to own children, right? Whatever you're making, you're making your coffee creamers, you're making yogurt, you're making milk, you're making biscuit, you're making whatever you're making in a scale. The, the, the simplest test is 
If you make that food and you serve it to your, your young children, if you're a CEO and if you're an executive, right, then you could serve to everybody else's children. And if, yep. it doesn't test, if, if, it doesn't test, if it doesn't pass that test, then you shouldn't be making that food. Well, and even How more than that, right? Like the, the U.S. is 40% diverse today, right? And we keep talking about the industry. I know many of you might not be in the consumer product space, but the top heap of the consumer product world is not 40% diverse. Uh, companies that look like Chobani and Mason Dixie do not exist in the big 10 that Hamdi's talking about. And so I, I'd like to just talk about that a little bit more too, Hamdi, is you know, from a diversity angle, you, you do have an incredibly diverse company. And as you said, naturally going through the applications in the incubator, you tended to found, find that the most mission-driven people were diverse people. Can you talk a little bit more about how you see that shifting? Obviously, the world's kind of on fire right now, right? There's, there's talks about the end of em empathetic leadership, right? How is Chobani changing that? And, you know, what do you think brands like Mason Dixie should be doing? And I'm happy to talk about what we're doing, but. Sure. I, through this journey, you know, we made it through. I mean, it's never over, but we are probably over 2 billion in sales over, we grew almost 30% last year. We entered into different, different platforms and categories. And we have over 2,000 people. And we have two large factories, one in Idaho, one in upstate New York. And I am live and active. One of the biggest solution that I have seen is coming from businesses. And, 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 and take it from me, because I grew up being against business. I think if business act right, like truly right, is the most powerful platform to solve most alarming problems that we're facing today. Yeah. Right? I've seen it in refugees. I've seen it in food insecurity. I've seen it in diversity and anything that you can name it, in climates and everything. The only caveat is meaningfully get involved. It's in part of their DNA. It's not check the box. It's not lip service and all that kind of stuff, which happens a lot. So the power of business is enormous. And there is two powers going on if this world of business is going to change. One is consumer, right? We all buy and use services and goods. And if you're going to use that power, we can force businesses to do things right. Yep. And the talent, the young talent, is coming into these platforms. And if we pick and choose companies that align with our ideas and how we see the world, then these companies are going to need the talent so they have, to, they have to be forced to church. I'm optimistic the world is going in the right direction, simply because I started this 2016 tent partnership for refugees from my own experience. In Utica, I started hiring refugees come to my plant. In South Edmiston, upstate New York, the first person who had an accent was, was uh, Frank, who's from Sicily, who had a pizzeria in that little town. <laughs> I was the second guy. They had never seen anyone from anywhere, anywhere else, right? Yeah. And when I realized that there were refugees settled in Utica, which is about 30 miles north of that town, and they were not, they had the right to work, but no one, they couldn't get a job, right? Yeah. Whether they didn't have cars, or they didn't have kind of training, or they didn't speak the language, whatever it is. Solving those simple problems, letting those people come to the factory, 15 different nationalities from all over the world, Africa, Middle East, South America, whatever it is, and realize that access to work, the minute refugee has a job, that's the minute they stop being a refugee. Yeah. And seeing this giving or handing out where people really want is opportunity. And taking that idea and using Tent Partnership for Refugees, today we have over 300 companies part of Tent Partnership for Refugees. And, and became a platform to hire hundreds of thousands of people uh, to be part of companies. Now, 2016, if you ask a company, say, hey, can you hire a refugee and speak loudly about it? That was a big no. Yep. Today, it became a really a good place because a conviction is made that this is not just good for refugees, but it's good for the company. Company in general, yeah. Company in general, right? This, is, this, is, this is affects your productivity, it affects your innovation, it affects your culture. Right? And 
and you'll never find more dedicated, hardworking people anywhere. Um, you can celebrate what? That you have 500 people celebrating their 10th anniversary at Chobani? At Chobani, yes. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah. Big round of applause. Um, obviously, you're embedding that mission and purpose in these people that they want to stay that long. So what do you think the integration is like for um, these diverse populations? You know, what do you think makes it work so well, given that once upon a time, there were only two guys with an accent? I really do believe, um, and I'm, I'm assuming that a lot of entrepreneurs here are, or startups, um, I really do believe the, the people side of things is the most important thing. You know, you might have the right product, it's important, you have to have it. You might have the right connections, technology, whatever it is. I really do believe the people side of things is the center, the most important things. And in especially the early days, the hardest time is the culture building time. Yes. You know it. Yes. And later on, you can write a lot of things in the walls. They don't mean anything. The living stories within the walls is the culture. And those cultures are built with minutes, hours, days, weeks. And the founders are extremely important in that journey. In a good days, you know, today I can be the nicest person, right? How are you when the times are tough? Yeah. How are you when you know that tomorrow might be your last day? How are you when you know that you lost the last batch of milk and you don't know where you're going to get the next one? How are you when you're in the most stressful times, right? Those are culture building times. And if you could build those culture building times, and that is only possible if you create an environment where everybody authentically can be themselves. You know, I had no choice. I was from Turkey, spoke very little English, had no knowledge of this industry, so I had a lot of shortcomings. If I could pretend that I know everything, I had to pretend really good. <laughs> and that would take vast majority of my time. Yeah. And you realize, even in upstate New York in a small town, for people to exist, they have to prevent, pre pretend so much. Yeah. And if you create an environment and say, really, truly, you're good, you're enough, you're perfect, you are who you are, I am what I am, let's figure this shit out together. If you can create that environment, enormous amount of waste is eliminated. Yeah. It's not the work of diversity, equity, that's, you know, it's, it's really bad. For me, it is a, it's an enormous amount of problem that we are working on it. We should, but it's a reality. But in reality, it shouldn't be a problem, right? We are all God's children or whatever it is. We are all equal, we are all same. Of course, that's not a question mark. But at least in my own place, whether however big that place is, that I can create something that we are all feeling home and we are all feeling ourselves. And that's not just a gift, that's just like, it is what it is. Yeah. And we're still gonna have problems, we're still gonna have an argument, we're still gonna have a disagreement, we're still gonna have bad time, you're still gonna be hiring and fighting, it's gonna happen. But this, that side of things, we are all ourselves, we are all authentic to ourselves. When that is created, it becomes an enormous amount of engine on business. You almost waste 50% of the time for this thing. And when people are themselves authentically, then they can create things that is original. Yeah. Right? It can be learned instead of being pretended. So I think it's good for business. Of course, it's good for everybody else. Like you come to a place by being yourself, you don't have to change, and you can go home by your, being by yourself. And then later on you realize, oh wow, look at this places it attracts all kinds of people from all over the place and they stay longer. Because you know, in the end we're trying to find home and we can create and, and, and present to the world. Hamdi's making this seem very simple, but it was pretty magical. I'm not even I was never an employee at Chobani, but being in the incubator, that is something that I noticed very quickly was this inherent ability of everyone to contribute to the company culture there which is very unique in large company settings, right? I'm sure many of you work for large corporations. You feel as though you have to wear 
the t-shirt or have that little poster that's on your desk that says, these are our core values and this is how we run the company. You, there is none of that there. There's just people on desks helping each other and wanting to help and there's this open transparency that really elevated, I think, the culture there and it's something that, if anything, that I took and, and stole from Mason Dixie, I think it was, how do I create that authentic environment where people can be themselves and contribute freely to the conversations happening at the company, be problem solvers on behalf of the company? Um, I wanna share one story. There's a woman that works for us on our team and she is a black woman. She hid in her previous corporate career that she had two children because she's a single mom. And she, so none of us knew she had kids. And she, one day she wanted to take a Friday off and made a big deal out about it. She's like, I gotta I got take this Friday off. I'm like, okay, take the Friday off. And later on she's, she apologized over email and said, I'm sorry I said it that way. I realized that never in my you know, 17 year career have I been open and honest enough to say that I have two children and my kid's really good at basketball and I wanted to see his game. That broke me. That broke me. I mean, I don't, I don't have kids, but as a woman, not, and as a woman of color, you don't think about that second identity that people are crafting in the workplace and how much they're hiding. If you create an environment like what Hamdi Chobani did, there is no hiding. There is just an open trust, and with trust comes people that try harder. And, and now that teammate of ours is one of, I'd say, a, a culture builder in the company. She's like this centrifugal force that like everybody gets around, even though she's also tough, like she's the tough coach, right? Like, but she's the one that is like centrifugal in the orbit. Um, so I think, you know, to that extent, I think having diverse thinking, having this transparency culture is really, really pivotal to the growth of, of any brand and company. Um, we're running out of time. I know that we actually will be taking questions. I'm sorry I didn't intro that in the beginning, and I think we're going to do it through the app, the Go app. Um, so I don't know if there's um, a way to queue up. Um, there's a couple questions here. Um, one question, would you say that a lot of your initial success, Hamdi, was based on how you cared for your employees and making a culture of care for their communities? Perfect segue. Yeah. Um, it's it, yes. I mean, we talked about this a little bit. I think the idea that everybody can come together, right? And the first thing that I have ever done at Chobani was 2009. The first money that we have ever made. Um, one of my colleagues came and said, Hamdi, in Norwich, um, there is there's a need for little league field oh, yeah. for baseball, and, and I don't I didn't grow up with baseball. I, we grew up playing football, soccer, but I lived in Cooperstown for a little bit because it was between my cheese plant and a yogurt plant, and I know how big it is for you know for for this country, and I have seen the the baseball field in Cooperstown. So I look at the pictures, it looked like mud and you know, really like ordinary field and I didn't realize the kids were playing there. So I said, okay, I don't want to give $10,000, let's do something here. And this is 2009, I can't believe I did that. So I said, let's create the community of this town, let's build a baseball little league field for, the, for this town children better than the one in Cooperstown. How do, you, how do you build something better than the one in Cooperstown? Mm -hmm. Cooperstown is the mecca of, of, of baseball, right? The kids come from all over the country to play baseball in that town. My point in that town was, if I can make the children feel worth it, then the town can wake up. So I brought the contractors, the electricity, direct, electricity contractors, the earth movers, and everybody get involved. It cost us all the profits we had made up to that month. And we built it with the lights, you know, you can play at night, the, where the parents can cook and sit, and still in that town. And we opened it in 4th of July, and it was the first time I ever touched the baseball ball, you know, throw it, first time ever. And the the kids first time yeah. ever, it didn't happen a lot after that, that someone asked me to sign something. I didn't realize the kids were asking me to sign their T-shirt. And this is 2009, a year after I started Chobani. 
I will never forget that moment. But what it does, what it did, is every parent came to that and saw their children playing at night with the lights and playing that baseball, reminded them that they were no different than any other kid. Yeah. They deserved it as much as anybody else, right? It made an enormous amount of shift. So it wasn't directly the workers, it was their children, right? So that sense of community is extremely important. And I always say, yeah, Austin is nice, San Francisco is nice, New York City is nice. Close your eyes, pick a town, forget about if they vote Republicans or Democrats, or whatever that is, doesn't matter. Just pick a town, go there, be part of that community, and build your startup or business aligned with those values, which is most of it, when you remove the top of it, is, is human spirit, human qualities, and see the magic happens. And that's the reason it happened. I am from Turkey, of course, and if I go to Turkey today, and if I go to my mountains, if I don't recognize me, they wouldn't know that I left. I didn't abandon where I came from, but what I did is when I arrived to that town, I saw the beauty, not the differences. Yeah. I saw the beauty and similarities before the differences. And similarity is those children love the baseball as much as I loved when I played next to Euphrates River playing soccer. And I would have loved to have a field that had the lights and had a good green field. And if I had somebody has done to me, I would have probably worshipped that person too. So I think the answer is yes. Not the mom, not, you know, this giving is a very sensitive thing, and I know we, we have run out of time. And I have an enormous amount of issue with this giving and taking things. Um, every time you give, something breaks if it's not done right. Yeah. It's a very delicate thing. I think by getting involved, being part, and creating a coalition, and creating a community, and playing your role in that community, instead of your community, I am this, I'm giving to you. You're this, and I'm this, I'm doing this to you. I'm handing out. That is, of course, solves certain problems, immediate problems. I know, I've been to refugee camps, and it does a lot of work, you know, if you're there and giving tent and food and all that kind of stuff. But in every act of not right giving, you break something. Yeah. And if we are conscious of that, and you say, okay, what's the best way? The best way is be part of it. Mm -hmm. Be with them and figure it out. The second thing is create an environment that let them make it themselves, right? So that was extremely important. So what I say always, Choban is not mine. Choban is, is, is Norwich, Choban is Twin Falls, Choban is Melbourne, Australia. It's an idea that I participated myself and we created together. And it so becomes extremely powerful. So as a follow-up then to a couple questions here, so do you think that would change if the company became publicly traded? I don't know. I, I don't know. I came close, I pull it out, I get nervous. <laughs> um, um, I'm, you know, this is something I think about all the time. There is, there, is a, there is a desire for me because a lot of everybody in the company has, you know, have access to the, to the shares and I want them to do something with them, with their families. Um, it's important, but at the same time, I have heartburns on how this will affect the yeah. company. So I don't know, I'll figure it out. But I think, I, think, I think what's important for me is as long as and you know, we are a startup, you have to be very careful and things can go extremely wrong when especially the time gets really difficult and the dollar signs gets a little bit stronger. As long as you make it very clear what is this all about. I mean, financially we are extremely successful, right? We do yeah. a lot of things, but we are never going to, like pandemic comes, we said put the, success, put the money aside, we're going to send a truckload of yogurt every week to a food bank around the country I don't care what that cost is. We have to participate in the community, right? We have to do this every day. Um, so it's very easy for us to make those kind of decisions. We say, all right, we're gonna do that, let's do that, and everybody gets participated. So when I am in it, and you know, 
who knows what happens to every, bus, every one of us every day, I know those decisions are going to be made no matter what. But how do I create something that beyond me, those decisions are made right, even in a public environment? I mean, it is it's a question that I have to think about twice. Hamdi, thank you. You've been amazing. I don't know about everybody else. I'm moved. Thank you.